Thank you very much, Anna, um, for this wonderful introduction. My name is uh, Jan Kranz, and right now um, we will investigate the notions of work and play in utopian and dystopian literature, specifically Morris's News from Nowhere and Huxley's Brave New World. My theses are the following. Firstly, uh, utopian societies tend to turn into dystopias. Dystopias tend to hold their dystopian status more easily. Secondly, the representations of the modes of work and play are symptomatic of this tendency, that they are predictors of impending overturn, much like a canary in a coal mine, if you will. First, I will provide a very brief uh, introduction to this subgenre of science fiction and introduce the worlds that uh, Morris and Huxley created in their novels. Afterwards, I will use uh, Marx's theory of alienation as well as Kalua's uh, definition of play as my tools of analysis. Lastly, I will uh, apply said tools to the novels, outlining similarities and more importantly, differences um, and how they can indeed be used as predictors of the state of a society. Let me give you a rundown of the genre definition then. Uh, the term itself, its etymology dates back to 1516 and was derived from Thomas More's novel uh, Utopia. A first uh, discussion of utopian literature can be found in John Dunlop's History of Fiction from 1814. And the first uh, genre definitions were provided by Sargent in 1967. Uh, Sargent distinguishes between a body utopia and a city utopia. Body describes a utopia that has been achieved without any human effort. City describes a utopia that came about through human contrivance. It is important to note here that uh, Sargent uses utopia as an umbrella term, uh, similar to how drama encompasses both comedy and tragedy. Uh, he distinguishes between utopia, which describes a society that is considerably better, and dystopia, a society that is considerably worth, worse than the time that the uh, author has lived in. Let's now look at a prime example of a utopia, namely uh, News from Nowhere. It was written by William Morris in 1890 and can be described as a socialist anti-novel which confronts the cruelties and hardships that came with early industrialization and capitalism. It is a utopian daydream that does not adhere to the usual conceptions of novels. In it, we follow William, who after a discussion with his, an with, with his uh, anarchist comrades falls asleep and wakes up in the London of the future. After wandering about for some short time, he meets Richard Hammond, who we will get to know as Dick. There are two instances of world building which are crucial to invigorating Morris's version of London. In the first, William gets confronted with the fact that his money is worthless, as neither services nor goods can be paid or need be paid rather. In the second, William is introduced to old Hammond, who vows to answer every of William's many questions regarding education and politics, etc. For free, naturally. Uh, I don't want to talk about much of it, about it here because it will come up uh, in my analysis again. Uh, let us now fix our gaze at an exemplary dystopian novel, only rivaled in fame by novel by Orwell's uh, 1984, namely all the Huxley's Brave New World. I'm sure most of you have heard of this work, uh, as it is by many regarded as the anti-utopian satire of the future. The world has become one state, the world state, its motto, community, identity, and stability. Everything is automated, and the optimization of production is admired with religious zeal. Ford and his conception of the assembly line is the new true God. 
And when I say everything is optimized, I mean literally everything. The world has moved away. It has overcome uh, the viparous, that is, ex utero birth. Instead, it has Boskinovsky's process. Uh, humans are created on an assembly line of eggs and sperm. Embryos are manipulated, their development stunted or accelerated to satisfy the societal and hierarchical needs of the world. In the world society, the cases are color-coded so that they can be distinguished. To further ensure the docility of the people, each of the cases undergoes their specific routines of Pavlovian conditioning. Dislike natural behaviors are discouraged through electroshocks, which even babies are subjected to. Like behaviors are uh, reinforced and gradually built upon to shape the human that you desire. Hypnopedia basically refers to the indoctrination of moral concepts during states of sleep. Here are some uh, proverbs which are repeated regularly. Um, no society, no social stability uh, without individual stability. And everyone belongs to everyone. Now that we have elaborated on the fundamental mechanisms on which these two societies are built upon, let us establish um, the theoretical tools for the analysis. And let us start with the theory of an alienation. According to Marx, labor is, first of all, a process between man and nature, a process by which man, through his own actions, mediates, regulates, and controls the metabolism between himself and nature. In his first manuscripts, Marx introduces the theory of alienation, which ultimately leads to the worker sinking to the level of a commodity. The process of labor consists of three distinct aspects. Firstly, the ability to perform labor is in itself a very basic human need. And secondly, the, um, the worker realizes his own purpose through imposing his own conscious will on the object on which the work is performed. And thirdly, instruments of labor function as conductors that enable the worker to form the object of labor to his will. So how does the worker become estranged from the activity or product of labor? Well, if neither the product, neither the, the object of labor nor the instrument with which labor is uh, conducted belongs to the worker himself, then the realization of labor is for the laborer at the same time the loss of the product and thus alienation. So the downward steps to the worker's estrangement are the following. The worker is alienated from the labor's product by the owner of labor, object, and instrument. The worker is alienated from the labor, from the activity of labor itself. And lastly, the worker is alienated from man as he himself becomes a commodity of the capitalist. Having established the concepts of the estranged worker and his alienation from his labor, let us now turn to Kalua, who provides us with a definition of play. According to Kalua, play is uh, inherently productive. It must be defined as free and voluntary activity, a source of joy and amusement. Another aspect of this definition is that one plays only when one wishes to. So, since we are now armed with a basic knowledge of the uh, two societies, as well as the theoretical tools, let us start um, the analysis by looking at the similarities. Both worlds are introduced to the reader through the fish out of water method, uh, meaning that the reader follows some inexperienced person who, just as we, is new to the world that unfolds before him. In News from Nowhere, we have William, the anarchist dreamer, who time travels to London of the future. In Brave New World, we have a flock of young students visiting the Hatchering and Conditioning Center. And this is pretty much where the similarities end. Work in News from Nowhere would have surely been to Marx's liking, 
as it is centered around honing one's craft and is thus character building. It is pleasurable. It is incredibly valuable as it can literally by all the money in the world. Since people take pride in their work, it becomes an art form. But since everyone is productive for the sake of their own and the society's well-being, work is also getting more and more scarce. Now, if we look at the instances of play, there isn't really uh, too much to hear as the only way to achieve truly popular art is uh, through the creation of a completely democratic society and a flat hierarchy was achieved in use from nowhere. Hence, there is no need for substitute gratifications. In Brave New World, on the other hand, there is life-threateningly dangerous work, unfulfilling peace work conducted by epsilons, deltas, and gammas, who truly are commodities in the most literal sense. And there are profiters in the form of betas and alphas who conduct the more cerebral work. To quote the, directory, the director of the Hatchery Center, the principles of mass production at last applied to biology. Unlike in news from nowhere, where work is gratifying and pleasurable, play is realized in many ways, keeps the individual from thinking any revolutionary or seditious thoughts. One of these mechanisms are mandatory obstacle golf units, which need to be completed in a certain amount of time. I'm sorry, um, but the most, uh, the most important mechanism is a, um, a state-enforced psychoactive drug called uh, Soma. And I have another uh, wonderful hypnopedic proverb for you. One cubic centimeter cures 10 gloomy sentiments. Here you have it. Definition of distraction straight from the horse's mouth. So then, let's have another look at uh, the theses. First one, um, I think the analysis suggests indeed that my first thesis um, holds up. News from nowhere is built upon an assumption of citicity. The lack of work or other external influences may very easily overturn this fictional society. Through the aforementioned distracting mechanisms realized in Brave New World, the world society is much less likely to overturn. It would further, I would further assert that uh, the representations of the modes of work and play function of this tendency um, has to be a reasonable assumption. And one might even go so far as to say that it might be to some uh, extenses of, of real life. I would very much like you to, um, I would very much like to thank you for your time um, these are my sources. If there are any questions, please just uh, just go ahead and, and feel free and ask me. I, I'll try to answer them uh, right now, or I will answer them uh, in the chat, whatever you uh, prefer.